Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think these are actually rated between 24 to 21 dB. So they're very, very quiet. Um, plus, we're going to be able to fully fan calibrate them. So the great thing is we're going to exactly know what their entire minimum and maximum fan curve is. So we can really control that. But they've got a very good bearing base design, which helps on the tonality. Um, and they've got a, a maximized kind of surface area blade design, which helps to bring in a lot of active airflow. So I think they're very competitive in terms of Noctua uh, fans. Yes, yeah, uh, yeah. the Noctua fans, I mean, they've got a lot of very advanced and kind of specialized hub bearing designs. Uh, they put in a lot of research and design and development, so they carry a bit of a premium, um, but they are outstanding quality fans. The read and write consistency is very solid. General performance is very, very solid. Uh, power consumption is very good, and they have very solid uh, quality validated firmware, which is really important as well. But if you want to go pure out ultra high performance, and you've got a couple of other options as well, such as the uh, 850 Pro, uh, the SanDisk 2 Extreme, or the new SanDisk um, Extreme Pro. Those have very good, very, very, very good performance and extremely good read and write consistency as well. Yeah, it'll get really exciting because probably by the beginning of next year, you'll start to see um, M.2 solutions or PCI-based SSDs that are based not on what's called AHCI, AHCI is the current transmission protocol that was develop, developed for serial ATA. But you know, that's been around since about like 2001. It's been around for a really, really long time. So similar to that kind of USB protocol that I was talking about where USB uses BOT, which is this archaic old protocol which works, but it, it's not really purpose designed for high speed storage. Um, the, the new uh, M.2 standard and PCI Express based devices can use a new protocol that's called MVME. So MVME has been natively designed for flash and for high speed memory. So you get much better, not only throughput, parallelism, but you also get lower latency. So it's gonna usher in really just an, an awesome next generation of storage devices. So here we're just putting in the, we're connecting the two, the two fans from the CPU cooler into the CPU fan and the CPU optional header. Uh, it's important to, to generally for the CPU cooling solution, those two fans, you always want to use the CPU and the CPU optional. Sometimes people from just whatever purpose, maybe like the cable's dropping down from like this fan and they run it back here and maybe they'll connect it to this chassis fan header. Mm -hmm. Now, for this generation of motherboard, we've got the really great design implementation that you can map that temperature input that I was talking to you about. So like the CPU, you could map it technically to that fan header so they could respond equally to the same temperature. But ideally the CPU and the CPU optional, they're designed for either what's called push and pull or for fans that are paired together to work. So it'll mirror whatever that primary CPU is as far as that. That's why it's the CPU optional. So you ideally, if you've got always a two fan based solution, whether it's a push or pull or whether they're working in tandem, um, they should always go on that CPU and CPU op. You shouldn't be running into another header. So what we did is we developed that technology. There's actually a hardware chip on here, and that's part of the reason why we don't have, we designed it so that even if the CPU can't initialize or the memory can't be initialized or the GPU can't initialize, we can still directly access that on a low level. Point over, right here? right here? Oh, okay, I see it. Yeah, we can overwrite it and we can recover it and get you back up and running. That's actually normally the same thing like in the past, the user would have actually had to contact like our service department, remove the chip, and send it into us and we would have manually overwritten it so rewriting it so that it's working because it's not physically damaged it's just corrupted oh. and so then you can re-overwrite it but here now we gave the user the ability to essentially do the same thing that we had in our team but there's like almost double layers of redundancy built in low cost vendors what they'll do is to save money is they solder this chip onto the motherboard because oh, it's can't, cheaper can't take it out. yeah but this is a non-soldered based design so even if in worst case scenario they the Exactly. Yeah. If the flashback didn't work, you could still call us and we could send it to you. You could pop one in there. So oh. it's about minimum. It supports four? both. All the, all the headers are actually all four pin, but we have the ability to control both. So we, the, what's called the output control signal, we can go ahead and set up to do both. And 
The main differential is going to be that with a three pin, or what's referred to sometimes as a DC based fan implementation, it's stepped based off of voltage that you should pr provide to the fan. So it usually works off of one voltage level or another voltage level, and that's how it kind of goes up and down. With a PWM based fan, of course, voltage still has to be supplied, but um, there's a lot more granularity in terms of the level of the control that can be provided. Um, and so this, what this pretty much just means is that what you're historically going to find is that PWM fans will allow for much wider ranges of min minimum operating speeds uh, and not generally maximum operating speeds, but generally minimum operating speeds. So you can get uh, PWM fans that can sometimes operate as low as maybe like 200 RPM. So very, 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 very low. So you get really, really quiet operation. Um, but a DC fan historically might only get down to maybe about like 600 RPM, maybe sometimes like 400 RPM. Okay. No I would definitely agree with that and our uh, my opinion is you should never for a high performance system you should never be satisfied or um, feel that the system has to be loud to be able to operate or be well cooled. I think it's all a question of ensuring that the chassis that you uh, purchase as well as the airflow how it's configured in with your system is, is suited for the components. Um, but as long as all those things are taken taken into consideration effectively, you should always be able to have even a high performance system and it be able to have a quiet level of operation. Thus, you know, it really actually depends a lot on your environment. Um, and ideally, though, you always won't prefer positive positive pressure. So that means you want more cool air being brought into the system as opposed to negative pressure. Um, there's almost no scenario where you ever really want negative pressure. So when you go about setting up your fans, you always want to ensure that you're bringing in more airflow. As far as you know, uh, dealing with dust and variables like that, it can become tricky because it depends on whether they're serving more as an ex exhaust or an intake. Intakes will have a higher likelihood of, of course, having dust build up, but that's where, of course, where you can have chassis that have things like fan filters where this makes it much easier. So you can remove something like that, then you can clean that off and you're good to go. So I normally recommend about once a month at the end of a month, just check your fan filters, see if they're entirely clean. Okay. Uh, and that'll generally help to make sure that you minimize any buildup of dust, you know, building up at certain points and, and limiting your overall airflow. Okay. Yeah, because we have, we have them connected. And then there's actually another one down here as well, so that it actually will shine on the PCI Express cards. Cool. Yeah. Here, like this chassis cable, uh -huh. I see I can pull it through here and I can slip it underneath the board, uh -huh. and then I can run it around there. So then it gives you sometimes like a much cleaner appearance because when I pull it through, yeah. you almost won't see it. It's, you know, it's a little, a little thing, thing. Yeah. but it's, it's a cool way of sometimes dealing with certain little cables that you want. Ethernet, but it doesn't have, this has 3x3, 811 AC wireless and Bluetooth built on board, right? You want to pair this with your smartphone or with a Bluetooth speaker, hey, you could do that, right? You know, so there's even other aspects from the connectivity standpoint that far reach out what that, uh, you know, platform enables can offer parity performance, uh, excuse me, it can offer performance about three to almost four times that of 10100 ethernet. Um, so when you talk about even being able to use it as a mechanism, like if you didn't want to have to run a cable across, you know, maybe a small like workstation or studio environment, you could legitimately be transferring, you know, or even streaming 2K, even 4K video wirelessly, right? I mean, you need an 811AC enabled router to be able to do that, but that's great so that if you don't have to run a whole cable across, but you know, I've got a NAS or I've got another system where I've got video on and I want to be able to stream or take that content or transfer it over, you've got a fast enough hardware solution built in that enables that experience. Plus with the dual NICs, that also is a great benefit because with two NICs, you, if you have like a local area network storage device or you've got other systems on the network, so maybe you have one for rendering, but then another system's for photo editing, you know, you have different breakups. One NIC can always be designated for inter-office transfers and the other NIC can be just for the internet and uploading. Now that's advantageous because if you're doing a lot of uploading or downloading, that can actually saturate your local network connection. So that's really the main benefit of two NICs is that one NIC is essentially your office work NIC and then the other NIC is purely for internet dependency or internet, excuse me, internet connectivity. Wow. So actually uh, you won't see it, but directly on the motherboard, um, there is actually diodes that associate with every single one of these points of connection on here. And so those are built in place because of course when you take certain devices and you plug them in, you can actually discharge static onto those ports. And so it's a, essentially there are secondary mechanisms to be able to help ensure the reliability over time.
Yeah. So your situation is a little bit interesting because one, you're uh, you're using software to accelerate your single drive's performance, and that software can be used to accelerate the performance of any storage volume. So even a rated volume, you could continue to improve it further. Okay. So it doesn't take away from the core concept of that when you evaluate RAID. RAID should be taken into consideration on based workflow. Uh, many users treat RAID from this the pure perspective of sometimes improving performance by like going with like a RAID zero. The disadvantage, of course, with uh, a RAID zero based configuration is, is that not all workloads always provide an improved level of performance. Depending on the way the controller has been designed, sometimes in some situations you might actually even get better performance under very specific types of workloads from a single higher performing base drive. So you really have to kind of evaluate that. And when it kind of comes into storage, um, when you talk about redundancy or RAID, the main thing that I always recommend and that I think is the most sensible is just ensure you have redundancy in your storage configuration. Now, the benefit of doing something like a RAID 1, which would just default mirror your backup, um, can, can be advantageous, but I don't recommend it for your primary storage array. The reason being is that close to 90% of problems that most uh, desktop users experience are always dependent on a software-based issue. So this could be a driver, it could be a software complex, it could be a virus infection, it could be malware, it could be any number of uh, variables. So if you're doing a RAID, uh, if you're doing a RAID 1, you're mirroring that same exact problem to the other drive. Um, RAID 1 came from the Dena uh, from data center and from enterprise-based association because it was designed to just mirror just pure storage environments, not operating systems. So if you are taking, let's say, your four terabyte and you're rating that, let's say, just media volume, where all you keep is, let's say, your, your finalized projects or just files, so photos and video files, but not anything operating system, that actually works very good in terms of doing a RAID 1 because you have a pure just backup redundancy of your data and you don't ever have to initiate a manual backup through a program or anything. But you can get really great applications, you know, like, uh, like Acronis True Image or even Windows is integrated. Um, backup systems that can also allow you to just quickly and easily every day do differential or incremental or do all kinds of different types of backup solutions. But as to, you know, the RAIDs, there are definitely things like you uh, noted. When you add more complexity, uh, such as like a RAID 5 uh, or RAID 10, one, you have to ca you consider rebuild time, uh, which can be lengthy, and the complexity of that it may not always work the way it's supposed to. Um, I generally don't ever recommend RAID 5 or RAID 10 to be executed on motherboards because one, they use the processor for the RAID, mm -hmm. and uh, you can have a multiple RAID rebuilding considerations. In that, uh, in that type of scenario, I would recommend that if you really do want to do a RAID 5 or RAID 10, then you consider a discrete RAID controller card specifically designed for that purpose. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, so it, the way I'm going about it then? Or? Um, in some scenarios, you're not. Um, like from a peak sequential level, you may be, but in other areas, you wouldn't be. A RAID, because you are physically utilizing those two drives and combining their workload performance, you are getting a more consistent improved level of performance versus in a software-based environment. Depending on how that software and its algorithms work, it may not exactly benefit you in every scenario. With a RAID, RAID configuration, it would be more consistently improved upon. But as I said, you could do a RAID and also still incorporate the software solution so you could even get better. Even get better. Okay. Yeah. I mean, can you give me some numbers of what, you know, obviously like my SSD, I'm pulling some pretty big numbers with that. Yeah, with, well, uh, for example, with uh, higher performing uh, memory configurations and higher performing uh, solutions that use really well optimized programs, you could easily exceed 8 to 10 gigabytes of actually read or write performance if you were to utilize more advanced solutions in combination with like RAID. So um, when you take a look, I think right now, some of your numbers are in about the four gig territory. You could double that or even go beyond that. With DDR4, there's even the possibility you could triple that throughput performance. Bring it right to the yeah. Board. So, you know, one of the benefits of this platform is, is that it actually has natively six USB ports that are built in part in the chipset. Um, but sometimes there's a misconception on people that uh, you can just keep adding controllers to a board and it, by adding those controllers, you're just adding more connections. But the implementation impacts performance. So in a certain situation, um, if you have what's called like a hub and you have 10 USB ports versus six USB ports, the hub is essentially just sharing bandwidth across all those ports. So you don't effectively really have um, true usable bandwidth across all 10 of those ports. Uh, even though six ports to a degree have actually some sharing that's occurring, but it's at a very, very high level. And there's a lot of performance that's provided to those six ports. Um, but this board take, for instance, what we've done is we have a discrete control. Controllers are more limited in performance. Um, their absolute peak throughput might be a little bit lower, 
but the benefit is that we can give it a dedicated what's called PCI lane so that ensures you get better performance regardless so whatever you're going to have connected or whatever you're going to do that controller is always going to give you guaranteed performance. Now I'm putting it in the bottom just because uh, if you put in an optical drive, you know, for like a Blu-ray is I think a good choice for any content creator because backup is something I think sometimes people forget about and Blu-rays are really actually a nice way to archive and also distribute your media, I think, in a very high quality. But that way, if we, if we of course have the optical drive tray, it would be above this, right? So it wouldn't impact your ability to be able to use the drive tray if you needed to. So uh, that's the reason why we're going with the bottom tray. Okay. This is a good little easy trick. Uh, is that if you can, you can always put screws back in some positions instead of putting them like in bags. You know what I mean? Like if you oh, ever right. you put them back in the same you place. Know that where you, to find yes, them. exactly. Because yeah. it's like you know, you you might forget though that you have it there. But if you can, so that's actually one of the really nice things compared to previous generation on the high end enthusiast side. So X seventy nine. Um, Thunderbolt actually came out after the original advent of X79, but it couldn't be easily added in because there was chipset requirements. But for this X99 chipset versus the X79 chipset, uh, you will actually be able on any ASUS board be able to add in Thunderbolt. So we've got like this little card, and we'll show you guys actually how it connects specifically once we put incorporated into the build. Um, but this will allow you to go ahead and leverage it. And uh, the great thing is you have, you have flexibility. You can get it in a single port solution or even a dual port solution. But Thunderbolt of course supports daisy chaining, so you could even have up to six concurrent currently uh, connected devices, but this is a great option for you guys that have very high speed uh, or more professional multimedia based devices that require Thunderbolt connectivity.